My alarm clock was as relentless as the expectations at work, a shrill sound marking the beginning of another 16-hour day. The ceiling stared back at me, a blank canvas to my thoughts of escape. Another day, another dwindling sliver of soul, I murmured to myself as I rolled out of bed. At the office, it was the usual scene. Desks cluttered with half-empty coffee cups and the blue hue of computer screens illuminating tired faces. My colleague, Mark, was already on his third cup of coffee, his eyes bloodshot, his fingers flying over the keyboard. Morning, Dave, he grunted without looking up. Server crashed again. Third time this week. I sighed, my shoulders heavy with the anticipation of troubleshooting. I swear, one day we'll look back at this and laugh. Mark snorted. Yeah, from our yachts or from the unemployment line. The train ride was the only time I had to myself, squeezed between strangers, all of us sharing the same glazed look. I'd normally close my eyes and let the rhythmic chug of the train lull me into a brief respite. But today, a soft sigh cut through the monotony. I opened my eyes and saw her, the woman with the weariness etched into her features and a child whose energy seemed to defy the early hour. She looked around for a seat, the little boy squirming in her arms. Without a second thought, I stood up. Please, take my seat, I offered. She looked up, surprised, a faint smile touching her lips. Are you sure? You look just as tired as I feel. I waved a hand dismissively, although she wasn't wrong. I insist. It's no trouble. Thank you, she accepted, settling into the seat with a relieved sigh. It's not often you meet a gentleman in the wild, she joked, a spark of humor lighting up her eyes. I chuckled, leaning against the pole. The wild's pretty tame at this hour. I'm Dave, by the way. Nice to meet you, Dave. I'm... Before she could finish, the train jolted, announcing my stop. This is me, I said, heading towards the door. Have a good day. You too, Dave. And thanks again, she called out as I disembarked, not realizing that small talk would lead to a life-changing conversation. Back in the grind, the day stretched on, an endless loop of coding and meetings. The office felt more like a machine than a place for humans. I wondered about the woman and the child, their story, and whether they found joy in their day as I tried to find in mine. Little did I know, fate had a curious way of answering such silent musings. A few weeks after my encounter with the mysterious woman and her child, the office was abuzz with a peculiar mix of anxiety and excitement. Words whispered across workstations and through the cubicle corridors spoke of her impending visit. She was the CEO, our company's enigmatic architect, whom rumors had painted as a cross between a tech visionary and a corporate phantom. I was trying to debug a stubborn line of code when I heard the voices of my colleagues rising over the clack of keyboards. Have you heard? She's coming today, whispered Sarah, the project manager, her eyes darting around like she was about to share a state secret. Tom, a junior developer, leaned in, his curiosity piqued. Who, the CEO? No one's ever even seen a picture of her. What if she's just an AI, and the real boss is sitting on a beach somewhere, laughing at us? Laughter broke out around the water cooler, a fleeting rebellion against our shared existential dread. I rolled my eyes and joined the group. If she's AI, I hope she can debug better than Tom here, I jested, aiming a playful elbow at him. Sarah's laugh was nervous, betraying her composure. Honestly, I don't know what's worse, an AI or the actual dragon lady the rumors describe. The hours ticked by, each minute a drumbeat leading up to her arrival. Finally, the moment came. The office fell silent as the elevator dinged, its doors sliding open to reveal the person who had, until now, been just a figment of our collective imaginations. She stepped out, and I felt the air catch in my throat. It was her, the woman from the train. She commanded the space with an ease that seemed to defy the stories we had spun. Her eyes swept across the room, pausing briefly to meet mine, a flicker of recognition passing between us. And there, scuttling at her side with a teddy bear dangling from his hand, was her son. I nudged Sarah, who was standing next to me. That's the woman from the train, I murmured under my breath, the one I told you about. 
Sarah's eyes widened as she turned to me. You mean to say you've met the ghost in the flesh? And you live to tell the tale? Before I could respond, our CEO began her address. Good morning, everyone. I hope I'm not as frightening as the rumors suggest, she said, her voice laced with a humor that seemed out of place in our sterile office environment. There was a collective release of breath as some chuckled nervously. I'm here not just to observe, but to connect with you all. To understand the heartbeat of this company. The day unfolded unlike any other. She wasn't the distant figure we had imagined, but someone with a sharp wit and an even sharper business sense. And as she mingled with employees, even stopping to listen to Tom's poorly timed joke about server crashes, it was clear she was rewriting her narrative in real time. Hey, she's not so bad, Tom whispered to me as we watched her interact with a group of developers, I mean, for a CEO. Yeah, I replied, maybe there's more to her than the stories. And more to us if we're willing to see it. As the shadows lengthened and the usual hum of computers began to soften into a quieter buzz, an unexpected message popped up on my screen. It was a calendar invite titled Private Meeting from none other than our CEO herself. My pulse quickened. A private meeting could mean a pat on the back or a kick out the door. I glanced at Mark, who caught the look on my face. What's up? He asked, his eyebrows knitting together in concern. The CEO wants to see me, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Mark whistled low. Wow, did you win the lottery or step on a landmine? I'm about to find out, I replied, standing up, my legs feeling like they were made of something much less solid than flesh and bone. With each step toward her office, my mind raced through every possible scenario. Maybe she'd heard about the code I debugged under pressure last week, or worse, the accidental reply all to an email that was meant for Mark's eyes only. I reached her door, took a deep breath to steady my racing heart, and knocked. Come in, David, her voice called out, surprisingly warm and nothing like the stern command I had braced for. She was standing by the window, the golden light casting a halo around her silhouette. The office was a stark contrast to the rest of the company, warm, with pictures of landscapes and a shelf of well-worn literature. The little boy was there too, in a corner, constructing what seemed to be a skyscraper from blocks. David, thank you for coming on such short notice, she began, turning to face me with a demeanor that suggested a comrade rather than a commander. No problem at all, I managed to say, trying to sound confident. I'll get straight to the point. I saw what you did a few weeks back, offering your seat to a stranger. It was a small act of kindness that most people wouldn't think twice about. But here, in this company, it's those human moments that have been missing, she said, her eyes locking onto mine. I was taken aback. I, well, it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. She walked over to her desk and gestured to the seat in front of it. Please, sit. I've been observing you since I took the helm here, and I've heard good things. Your colleagues respect you, and your work ethic speaks volumes. Sitting down, I felt a mix of pride and confusion. I'm just doing my job, I said. Yes, but you do it with a sense of humanity. You care, David, and that's what I need for what I'm about to propose, she explained, her hands folded on the desk. I have a new project, something that's going to change the fabric of this company. It's about bringing life back into these walls, making this place somewhere people don't just work, but live. And I want you to lead it. Her words hit me like a shockwave. Lead a project? Change the company? Me? But I'm just a developer. I don't know anything about leading such a thing, I stammered. She smiled, a genuine uplift of her lips that reached her eyes. David, it's not just about skills, it's about perspective. You see things others don't, feel things others overlook. That's why I chose you. I sat there, dumbfounded. The CEO, this mysterious figure who had intimidated everyone from afar, was entrusting me with a vision that could alter the trajectory of my career and perhaps the company itself. As I left her office, her last words echoed in my mind, think about it, but not too long. I have a feeling you're the right person for this, David. The door closed behind me, 
and I stood in the hallway, the weight of opportunity heavy on my shoulders. Was I about to rise to the challenge or crumble under the pressure? Only time would tell. The next morning, the sun seemed to rise with a different promise, casting long, ambitious shadows across my room. I dressed with a certain deliberation, aware that today marked the beginning of something monumental. The weight of the CEO's offer lay on me, not burdensome, but as an armor of purpose. I arrived early, the office quiet except for the hum of the vending machine. My mind was a swirl of project plans and potential, but I needed to touch base with the reality I knew best. I booted up my computer when Sarah approached, her usual composed self replaced by an air of curiosity. So, are you going to tell me what the secret meeting was all about, she inquired, leaning against my desk with a smirk. It's big, I started, my voice tinged with the awe I felt. She wants me to lead a new project, something about reinvigorating the company culture, making this place human again. Sarah's smirk melted into a look of genuine excitement. That's amazing, David. But what does that mean for us? For all of us? Before I could answer, Mark joined in, overhearing the tail end of our conversation. Did I just hear that right? Dave, the people's champion, is going to save us from corporate drudgery? I chuckled, the camaraderie easing my nerves. Something like that. She has this vision of a company that values more than just the bottom line. Think flexible work hours, family days, and bringing life to these walls. And she thinks I can help make that happen. The office started to fill up, a buzz growing as news of the project began to spread. It wasn't long before the CEO called an impromptu meeting to officially announce the initiative. We gathered in the largest open space in the office, a sea of curious faces. Good morning, everyone. Her voice cut clear and strong across the room. I want to talk about change, about growth not just in revenue, but in our work environment. To lead this, I've chosen David, who you all know not just as a diligent worker, but as someone who embodies the spirit of what I envisioned for our future. A ripple of applause broke out, and I felt my cheeks warm under the attention. As the meeting broke up, the CEO pulled me aside. Are you ready for this, David? It's going to be a challenge, but I believe you have the creativity and the empathy we need. I took a deep breath, letting her confidence in me fuel my resolve. I am. I've got ideas, and with the right team, I think we can really make a difference. That's what I want to hear. Remember, this isn't just about changing policies, it's about changing minds. We're in this together, she reassured, giving my shoulder a firm, encouraging squeeze. Over the next few weeks, the office began to transform. The sterile white walls became canvases for local artists, the break rooms filled with more than just coffee but games and books that encouraged interaction. The sound of laughter became a common thread in the fabric of our daily routine. I worked closely with Sarah and Mark, who were instrumental in pushing forward initiatives like in-office daycare and flexible scheduling. We were building something, piece by piece, idea by idea, a company that felt less like a machine and more like a community. Look at this place, Mark said one afternoon as we watched kids from the daycare racing homemade sailboats across a water feature we'd installed in the lobby. I never thought I'd see the day when our office would be full of life. Sarah nodded, her eyes reflecting the vibrant changes around us. It's incredible. And to think, this all started with a simple act of kindness on a train ride. I watched the children play, their laughter a testament to the new horizon we were all heading towards. The CEO's vision and my small part in it were coming to fruition, but it was the collective effort that made it real. For the first time in a long time, I looked forward to the days ahead, knowing we were creating a place where work and life didn't just coexist, they thrived. Months had passed since the whirlwind of change began to blow through our company. Our workplace had transformed, mirroring the vibrancy of spring's full bloom outside the office windows. The laughter and chatter of children now mingled with the clacking of keyboards and artwork adorned spaces once sterile and cold. It was on one of these days, filled with the new normalcy of vibrance and vigor, that I found myself pausing to take it all in. 
The CEO's son, now a familiar little figure darting between desks and laughter, zoomed past me with a paper airplane aloft in his hands. His mother, our CEO, wasn't far behind, her eyes following him with a mix of pride and gentle admonishment. James, remember not to disturb the others, she called out, her voice the perfect blend of authority and warmth. I laughed, approaching her. I think everyone's getting a bit more done with the new energy around here, I commented, watching as James made a smooth landing with his plane on a nearby couch. She turned to me, her eyes reflecting the changes around us. It's something, isn't it? From the seed of a single good deed to this. She gestured around at the lively scene. It's more than something. It's a new beginning, I replied, feeling a swell of pride for the part I'd played in this transformation. We walked together through the office, watching as teams collaborated not just on work but on life, sharing stories of their families, their hobbies, their dreams. This is what I always envisioned, she confessed, her gaze settling on a group gathered around a newly installed espresso machine. A place where people don't just exist, but live and thrive. I nodded, the magnitude of her words resonating deeply within me. It was a brave move, betting on people's spirits rather than their output. She stopped and faced me, her expression earnest. It was the only move that made sense to me. People are not cogs in a machine, David. They're the heartbeat of any company. You understood that, and it's why you were the right person to lead this. We paused near the large windows, the golden hues of the setting sun casting a warm glow over us. You know, James loves it here. He says he has a hundred friends now, she said, her smile tinged with a mother's love. That's the best endorsement we could ask for, I said, thinking of the innocent joy that had become our daily soundtrack. The office was quieting down as people began to head home, a concept we could now afford to embrace with our flexible hours. The CEO's son came running back to us, his energy undiminished by the day's end. Mom, did you see my plane? It flew all the way across the world, he exclaimed, his imagination boundless within the walls we had all built together. I did, honey, she replied, scooping him up into her arms. And it was wonderful. She looked at me, her eyes glinting with a silent acknowledgement of the journey we'd embarked on together. You started this, you know, she said softly. Your act of kindness showed me the potential we had here. I shrugged modestly. I just gave up a seat. She shook her head, her voice firm. No, David. You gave us hope. Hope that there's more to work than just deadlines and demands. And that's what sparked all of this. I left the office that evening with a sense of accomplishment that went beyond professional success. It was a feeling of having touched lives, of having woven a thread of humanity through the tapestry of a corporate world. My life had come full circle, from the depths of the daily grind to the heights of a fulfilled vision. And it all began with a simple, human act on a routine train ride. Can you believe that?